Good morning, everyone. This, is the, this was the first playground in New York City. Good morning, everyone. There we go. 129 years of energy here. Um, my name is David Garza. I'm the president and CEO of Henry Street Settlement. Uh, welcome to all of you. I want to thank Commissioner Dr. Ashwin Vasin and Deputy Mayor Ann Williams Isom for being here today and for your profound commitment to the health of New York City and for your support for organizations like ours, which is so critical to making sure our neighbors receive what they need to live healthy, safe, and fulfilling lives. We've been part of the fabric of Henry Street Settlement for 129 years, opening doors of opportunity, trying to change and save lives. And I would be remiss if I didn't take a special moment to acknowledge the clinical team at Henry Street Settlement who's back behind the wall for all the extraordinary work they do day in, day out. I also want to thank the team that helped put this event together today because we're profoundly grateful to host you. Community health is deeply ingrained in Henry Street's DNA and in the Settlement House philosophy. This garden is directly relevant to today's event. It was established by our founder, Lillian Wald, who was a pioneer in the field of public health in the late 1800s. She opened these very same doors to provide children and adults with a respite from the chaotic city in support of their health and well-being. Today, we actually have youth here today from the Lower East Side Ecology Center still using it for that very same purpose. In 1946, Henry Street Settlement created a mental health hygiene clinic, later renamed the Community Consultation Center, which some of us will visit together later today. It was one of the first clinics of its kind, opened in recognition that both adults and children needed flexible, responsive mental health care close to home, co-located with, co with primary health care, and literally located in public housing. In the 80s, the center became one of the first mental health clinics in the nation to serve those dealing with HIV and AIDS. Today, once again, we find ourselves in a mental health crisis prompted by grief, loss, economic disruption, and isolation. As part of the larger COVID recovery effort, Henry Street Settlement is proud to partner with the city of New York to be a connect site. Connect brings us full circle, getting back to our roots in providing highly flexible, innovative community-based services, meeting people where they are, a clinic without walls in true settlement house form. As a settlement house, we believe in serving the whole person, the whole family, the whole neighborhood. And so we are profoundly grateful to welcome you to our Lower East Side neighborhood here today. So many of the individuals we serve at every age are suffering from the tsunami of mental health challenges that is overcoming our city. And it's not just the person you see in crisis on the street. It is your neighbor, it is your coworker, it is your friend, it is your parent, it is your child. And so the only response is for all of us to work together toward a solution. And now to tell you more about those efforts, I am pleased to introduce Deputy Mayor Ann Williams Isom. David, you were nervous about getting my name wrong. You just got my husband's name wrong, but that's okay. But you did good. It was good. Ice, ice, ice them. <laughs> David said he just, we met each other for the first time, but I know so much about Henry Street. So thank you so much for hosting us and thank you so much for all the work that you do. It's very close to my heart. I am Ann Williams Isom. I am the Deputy Mayor for Health and Human Services, and I am so happy to be here today with you for this very important event. I often hear Ashwin say that mental health is public health and public health is mental health. And so that's why it's so important for us to be here today. It rings so true for me because my whole career has been about supporting children and families. First at the Administration for Children's Services and then at the Harlem Children's Zone. And while I like my title of Deputy Mayor, my favorite title is Miss Ann. And that's what the young people in Harlem call me. When I think about these past two years and all of the suffering that our young people have gone through, it reminds me of one particular young man that I'll call Sabian. Sabian saw me after a year or so of isolation and I heard a scream that was across the, 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 um, from the bodega across the street to my house that was like, Miss Ann! And I went to go hug him. He didn't have a mask on, so I was like, put your mask on, and had to give him the biggest hug ever because I know the healing power of hugs. I used to call myself the chief healer at the Harlem Children's Home. 
so many of those young people had trauma that they experienced way before the pandemic. This young man, Sabian in particular, they wanted to kick him out of school many, many times. He had some mental health challenges and nobody could seem to control him. His mother called me one afternoon crying and was like, Miss Ann, I don't know what I need to do. So we marched in together with his grandmother and his mother and demanded that he get the services that he needs so that he could stay in school. That young man ended up going to college and is doing fine today. We know that if young people get what they need and if we give them the services that they need, that they and their families can be well. So many families in New York City struggle to find the support that they need for their children. This is why this work is so important to me. And these past two years, all of us have been through such grieving, such loss, such difficult situations. But today is about hope. It's about the vision of a collective and comprehensive set of solutions to face these challenges. Young people and their families who have these challenges, but also adults with serious mental illness and how the pandemic has made those things even worse. So I am honored today to have the privilege. It says here that to introduce my friend. Are we friends already after these 20 weeks? Can I call you that? And colleague, the Commissioner of Health, Dr. Vassan. I just met him 20 weeks ago, but when you go through something with someone at a time when it's really difficult, you do get to bond with that person. You get to see what they're made of. You get to see their values. You get to see what's important. What I've learned the most about Ashwin is how much he loves his family. This job has been really difficult for a lot of different reasons, but some of the things that he's had to deal with because he's the city doctor has affected his family. And what I've seen from him is that he puts them first, his three little ones, his wife, and stays committed to what he needs to do. So, in addition to him being this wonderful family man, this person who takes this job seriously because he's seen it from all personal angles, he also comes with a very, very impressive resume. Ashwin comes to this role from the Department of Health and Hygiene many years ago, where he was also um, serving here. Most recently, he was the president and CEO of Fountain House, an organization serving people with severe mental illness. Ashwin expanded Fountain House from New York from a New York-centered organization to a national organization serving eight markets and grew its budget to 20 million. Prior to that, Ashwin served as the founding executive director of Health Equity, Health Access Equity Unit at the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. A primary care doctor and an epidemiologist, which he tells me every day, Ashwin has served for many years as a physician in the New York Presbyterian system. Ashwin has been a longtime professor at Columbia, serving both Mailman School of Public Health and Vlagos College of Physicians and Surgeons. Serving the global community as well, Ashwin spent time with the World Health Organization and Public Health Solutions, among, among other entities, where he served in Rwanda, Tanzania, Uganda, and Switzerland. Ashwin holds a PhD in public health from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, an MD from the University of Michigan, an MS in epidemiology from Harvard, Chan School of Public Health, and a BA in economics from UCLA. That's a lot of degrees, brother. I guess I should give you a little bit more respect. You should have told me. So it is my pleasure and my profound um, happiness, with profound happiness, to present the city's doctor, Dr. Ashwin Vasan, and I can say 100% the city and we are in very good hands. Ashwin. Good morning. Um, it's a true honor to be here today to talk to you about something that's so near and dear to my heart, mental health. Um, after two years of the COVID pandemic, there's never been a more important time to center mental health in the public health agenda of our city. Um, of course, I want to thank my friend, Deputy Mayor Ann williams Isom. I just have to say for a minute, I think the mayor made an inspiring choice to lead, an inspired choice to lead our health and human services portfolio. Um, I have never met a leader as authentic, as passionate, as compassionate, and as rigorous as Ann williams Isom, and we are better for it as a city. Um, 
all of our health and human services agencies are better for it, and our children are better for it. Um, I also want to thank, thank uh, City Council Health and Mental Health Chairs, um, Council Members Lynn Schulman and Linda Lee for being here today. Let's give them a round. And I'm very grateful to David and everyone here at Henry Street Settlement for hosting us in this beautiful courtyard and for the tremendous work you do on behalf of New Yorkers. Like the health department, Henry Street was established to improve poor conditions in immigrant neighborhoods and quickly evolved to respond to intersecting issues of health and social need. They are the embodiment of meeting the community where they are and providing a range of supports that reflect and improve people's lives, which is ultimately the, the work of health. A special welcome to my public health and healthcare colleagues joining us from organizations, public and private, large and small, research and practice based. The range of specialties, geographies, and approaches you represent is a microcosm of the broad and unified coalition we will need to confront our city's mental health crisis. And it is indeed a crisis. I have previously even referred to it as a second pandemic because of its scale and the widespread nature, especially in places hardest hit by COVID-19. And it's one so large and so threatening to the functioning and well-being of our city that it will take all of us, and I mean all of us, healthcare workers and policymakers, parents and caregivers, teachers and administrators, business leaders and clergy, our friends, neighbors, acquaintances and loved ones. We are all in this together. This is an issue that's deeply personal to me. I lost my uncle to suicide and alcoholism when I was 10. I really looked up to him. He was smart and cool and worldly. and um, I didn't even know he took his own life until more than 25 years later. Such was the degree of stigma and shame and cultural discrimination against mental illness in my immigrant community. As Anne mentioned, I'm also the father of three school-aged children who sees every day how the pandemic has impacted their mental health and well-being. As someone who has sought mental health supports for my family and for myself, I know how confusing and frustrating the system can be, if you can even call it a system. New Yorkers are in pain. None of us has emerged from the last two years emotion emotionally unscathed. Grief, loss, trauma, isolation, fear, racism, distrust, hate, economic insecurity, violence, and political strife have seen and resulted in steep declines in mental health. And like COVID-19 itself, the effects have not been felt equally. Food, job, and housing insecurity experienced disproportionately by people of color has compounded the impact of the pandemic on the mental and physical health of far too many. As we navigate this tricky transitional phase between, of COVID-19, between emergency and endemicity, between rapid response and recovery, we must acknowledge how none of us has really had the time to heal, to breathe out, and to just figure out how to move about and just to be in this new world we're in. In addition to being a primary care doctor, as mentioned, who has cared for many low-income people facing intersecting health, mental health, and social needs, I'm an epidemiologist, and my view on the world is shaped in part by population-level health data. So while we see with our eyes and we feel with our hearts the pain and the need within and around us, what do we know empirically? What do the data tell us? The health department, health department surveys conducted in the last year found that New Yorkers are experiencing anxiety, depression, and financial stress. One in four reported symptoms of anxiety, and one in five reported symptoms of depression. According to a recent nonprofit survey, half of youth ages 18 to 24 reported symptoms of anxiety or depression over the last, and over the last decade, suicides amongst 20, 10 to 24 year olds have risen by 30%. And the reality is the mental health crisis is not new. It's just gotten worse. For more than 20 years, we've seen a dramatic increase in deaths of despair from suicide, overdose, and the effects of alcoholism across this city and this nation. These data tell us that we've neglected mental health as a public health priority for far too long. And when we have made attempts, our responses have not been durable. We can and must do more. We must build systems that meet the problem at scale, that offer widely accessible but tailored solutions, and that consistently 
prioritize prevention and early intervention as much as treatment, support, and rehabilitation. We must call for a full-scale, systemically transformative response, one that the city and this Department of Health and Mental Hygiene is stepping up to lead in partnership with stakeholders inside and outside of government. While the pandemic has had mental health consequences for us all, there are three groups that have felt the impact particularly hard. Our children and youth and their families, especially those of color, people with more serious and sometimes disabling forms of mental illness, such as schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, major depression, or PTSD, and people facing substance use and addiction issues, especially with opioids, and who are at risk of overdose. Today, I will give a broad overview of some of the ways we are restructuring our city's strategy around these core areas, and how we can partner and work together to transform our entire mental health and public health landscape at a moment of increasing need and urgency. Before the pandemic, nearly 40% of New York City high schoolers reported feeling sad or hopeless every day for more than two weeks. National suicide rates amongst black youth have risen sharply in the past two decades. A report released this month by the Trevor Project revealed that 45% of LGBTQ plus youth said they had seriously considered suicide in the past year. And a recent health department report showed that 26% of Asian and Pacific Islander middle schoolers in New York City, more than their white, black, and Latino peers, have also seriously considered suicide. Our children are hurting. Mental health supports for children are too hard to navigate and too scarce in supply. This results in emergency rooms and hospitals providing care that is best delivered in homes, communities, and schools. A better system to support children, youth, and families means, for starters, a stronger and more stable school nursing workforce, one capable of identifying and screening for mental health issues in children, providing immediate counseling, de-escalation, and relief, and able to make referrals to next level care. This will, of course, require an increasing team effort in our schools with teachers, staff, and administrators who are able to recognize changes in behavior and academic performance as potential leading indicators of underlying mental health needs. This also means continuing to strengthen all of the mental health programs within our schools, including school-based health clinics. We must ensure they are staffed, trained, and equipped to deal with the mental health concerns of the thousands of New York City students who depend on them. I know these goals are shared by Chancellor Banks and our colleagues at the Department of Education. As ever, we are eager to advance our work together through our joint office of school health to support students' social and emotional well-being. A better system also means leaning on community-based organizations, faith-based organizations, and myriad nonprofits that are a critical pillar of youth mental health, of a youth mental health delivery system. They are trusted community messengers and service providers because they know how to engage youth facing mental health challenges and often underlying trauma in a non-stigmatizing manner. The work of these organizations should not be regarded as projects or bright lights, but must be brought into a comprehensive system of youth mental health services, a coherent structure of cross-institutional coordination and communication designed to ensure that young people with mental health needs don't fall through the cracks or miss out on opportunities for timely, effective services and care. Our kids also need access to community-based mental health care interventions, such as counseling and talk therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, and dialectic behavioral therapy, care for complex trauma and ADHD, and ongoing medication management. The social isolation loss and uncertainty of the past few years have only exacerbated these needs, and our health care systems must step up to meet the rising demand and challenges this presents. We must continue to work across our health care systems to increase access to children's mental health services and child and adolescent psychiatry, which are in short supply in our city. And trust me, I know, one of my children is on a six-month wait list to get the support they need. If navigating the system and getting help is so difficult for me, a person with relative access and power, imagine what it's like for those without. This cannot go on. While working on these wider systemic challenges, we can help children heal now 
and create cultures of open dialogue and understanding by investing in proven models of community-initiated care and peer supports. These informal systems and workforce improvements must also be accompanied by training, supporting, and support and creation of spaces for young people to develop key leadership and life skills, to care for one another, to build communities and networks of mutual support and aid, and to grow into the next generation of leaders and doers in this great city of ours. The path out of our youth mental health crisis must be an all hands and all communities on deck moment. Wherever young people gather, people should have the requisite skills, knowledge, will, and compassion to recognize and respond to needs and crises. As they help lay the foundations for open communication and emotional well-being, we will bring to bear our full range of public health and community resources, along with our compassion and resolve to prevent crises and provide better access to care for our city's youth. While we focus on our children, we cannot forget a group of people who are among the most stigmatized, marginalized, and isolated in our city, people living with serious mental illness, or SMI. Frankly, the issue is a political football, used by some to embody our problems with rising violence and hate, and by others to highlight failures in compassion and services. All the while, in reality, being mostly ignored and unseen by all of us. But make no mistake, people with SMI are our brothers, our sisters, our parents, our friends, and our neighbors. Everyone deserves to be seen, to be treated with dignity, and to be welcomed as full members of the community. There are over 250,000 New Yorkers known to have SMI, up to 40% of whom are disconnected from all or most forms of care. Many of these New Yorkers are isolated in their homes, or more tragically, living on our streets and subways, in our shelters, cycling in and out of hospitals and jails, the latter of which remain the largest providers of mental health treatment in our city and in our country. People with SMI in the US lose up to 25 years of life on average, dying prematurely and disproportionately from cardiovascular disease, stroke, sepsis, and tobacco-related diseases and cancers. This is a result of cumulative neglect, social and economic isolation, and frank discrimination from society as well as from healthcare systems. It should come as no surprise then that those with serious mental illness who are already predisposed to isolation, medical neglect, and stigma entered the pandemic most at risk of its worst outcomes. Study after study from around the world has shown that SMI is among the top risk factors for poor COVID-19 outcomes. One study from Bellevue found SMI to be the second leading risk factor for death among hospitalized patients with COVID-19. The physical and social dislocation that people with SMI confronted during the pandemic and made worse what was already their biggest threat to their health and well-being, deep social and economic isolation. Isolation has measurable negative effects on our, on our bodies. It increases our stress hormone levels, decreases our brain function and plasticity, places us at higher risk of infections and prevents us from healing. It leads to medical neglect and increased risk behavior like substance misuse. We must move away from the idea that all people living with serious mental illness are simply moving from crisis to crisis and can only be helped with acute care and hospitalization. We must instead move towards a model of prevention and recovery centered on breaking isolation. We will do this by investing in social infrastructure, literal places and destinations, much like this one, where people can build community and end social isolation, where they can develop direct human connections as well as connections to healthcare, to housing, to opportunity, and to purpose, on paths to recovery and to learning to live with a serious mental illness. A perfectly named example is Connect, a treatment program we announced yesterday with locations here at Henry Street and around the city that draws the surrounding community in together to supplement clinical care within an array of services in a single location. When surrounded by the right supports, resources, and connections and hope, people can live and even thrive with serious mental illness in the community and not be relegated to institutions like the asylums of our past or the jails, prisons, and hospitals of our present. We have allowed people with SMI to become victims of our failures and of our soft bigotry of low expectations and instead have given too little thought, time, resources, and attention to meet the holistic needs of this most marginalized of peoples. And this must stop. 
Recovery-oriented mental health systems rooted in community and connection save lives and prevent crises. They are, frankly, a public health no-brainer. Investing in these systems of care, housing, and social infrastructure is shown to reduce hospitalization, homelessness, while increasing rates of employment and educational attainment. And I should know, I ran just such an organization and, and a model prior to coming into this role. And I know the restorative power of community and connection on health and well-being, as well as on public health and public policy outcomes. I know what good looks like, and we must have the will to follow through and invest in it at scale. In that regard, we're also very proud to be working with Chief Housing Officer Jessica Katz and our partner agencies, the Departments of Social Services and of Housing Preservation and Development to rethink and improve our supportive housing programs for people with mental health needs, a critical pillar of recovery for people with serious mental illness. We're also committed to strengthening NYC Well and other health-first crisis response systems that people in crisis, to ensure that people in crisis get the, help, the care they need when they need it. We will soon be announcing expansion of NYC Well and resources to support the rollout of the new 988 Federal Crisis Response Hotline, which will go live this summer. New York City already is a national leader in providing immediate telephonic, virtual, and in-person resources for people with a range of mental health needs, from counseling and referral services to acute crisis response. And we're proud that as 988 comes online, New Yorkers will be able to dial either 1-888-NYC-WELL or 988 and receive the same best-in-class mental health services in over 200 languages, regardless of immigration or insurance status. Similarly, the city's Be Heard pilot program providing emergency mental health care to people who place 911 crisis calls is an example of the city's commitment to treating mental health emergencies as a health issue, not a public safety issue. We thank our colleagues at the Office of Community Mental Health, Health and Hospitals, and the New York City Fire Department for their leadership and partnership in this critical program. And we're actively working with our state and healthcare partners, including our public hospital system, to expand access to psychiatric beds, streamline referrals and discharges into our growing crisis stabilization and respite systems, and to make strategic changes to Kendra's Law and assisted outpatient treatment to ensure that people with deep and intractable SMI do not face administrative hurdles to getting the care they want and need. And of course, no conversation or commitment to tackling our mental health crisis can leave out the intersecting overdose epidemic. Overdoses have many drivers, and while more recently the presence of fentanyl in our drug supply has been an accelerant, we have seen rising opioid and overdose-related deaths for the last decade. And at the root of almost every overdose and substance use disorder is pain and mental health concerns of some kind. It's time we stop treating these issues as separate, just because as a society, we choose to stigmatize them in different ways. The overdose crisis is taking the life of a New Yorker every four hours and would be regarded as a five alarm public health emergency were it not for COVID-19. A record number of New Yorkers died in 2020 from overdose and we expect that will be surpassed in the 2021 data. That's more deaths from overdoses than from homicides, suicides and motor vehicle crashes combined. And overdoses, like most public health crises, exposed deeply entrenched inequities in this city, with overdose rates for black New Yorkers more than 25% higher than the citywide average. Despite these challenges and despite rising need, New York City and the Health Department have and will continue to lead the nation in efforts to combat the overdose crisis. Through our Healing NYC framework and in partnership with many community providers and our public hospital system, we have launched a range of supports for people who use drugs, including investing in harm reduction through our syringe service providers, which reduce injection-related infections and offer a range of accompanying social health and mental health supports. Our NYC Relay team connects people in emergency rooms who have experienced a non-fatal overdose with a peer community health worker for 90 days post-overdose, knowing that that time period is a particularly vulnerable one for a subsequent fatal event. And we have invested in methadone and medication for addiction treatment for opioid use disorder, as well as widespread training and distribution of naloxone, including through our innovative public health vending machines. More recently, 
we opened the nation's first two overdose prevention centers, located in neighborhoods with some of the greatest rates of overdoses. They've been established thanks to our partnership with OnPoint, one of the city's syringe service providers. In just five short months, the two locations have served more than 1,000 people, and staff have intervened to avert about 300 potentially fatal overdoses. I visited an OPC just last week and had the privilege of seeing how much this success derives from the compassion and experience of staff. I witnessed them intervene in a potentially fatal overdose. It took every ounce of my body not to jump in myself. Um, but I watched them intervene with calm and compassion and expertise, likely saving a life. And make no mistake, these programs save lives. We also see the community benefits of a place-based approach. OPCs and other harm reduction services not only reduce overdose deaths, but decrease syringe litter, public drug use, and drug-related crime in their surroundings. Working with our syringe service providers, we are committed to seeing this model expand across our city, in part by expanding drop-in hours and providing crucial mental health and primary care connections to meet the needs of New Yorkers who rely on these services every day. Thanks to the state attorney general, who secured sorely needed funding from private companies that sought to profit from so much pain. There is significant money to be invested in our evidence-based prevention, harm reduction, and treatment approaches in the communities that need them the most. The time to act is now, and we know what works. As a city, we're committed to seeing these programs grow so we no longer have to say goodbye to so many of our neighbors and loved ones due to overdose. The integrated systems of community connection and care that I've laid out here today advance health equity, dignity, and compassion at a population level. In other words, they are the essence of public health. And because public health means working at scale for everyone, we must center equity on our path forward. We must also bear in mind that public health is not only a service or a provider or a project. Public health builds systems and advances policies that impact population health. It's time these population level tools and solutions were deployed to address our mental health epidemic in New York City. Previous mental health initiatives in our city made critical progress towards naming, prioritizing, and normalizing the topic of mental health. They created a sense of collective responsibility for what has too long been regarded as an individual problem or a failing for you or you or me or you to keep to yourself and to solve on your own. In doing so, they made mental health a core piece of public administration. But the fact is that our community mental health systems are badly broken, a product of generations of neglect and disinvestment across every level of government and the private sector. Much as we've stigmatized mental health as a society for years, we have allowed that to infect our policy, which has led to continuous defunding and criminalization of mental health across our nation and the absence of functional, coordinated community mental health systems. But the tides are shifting, and the moment to ride the wave is now. Rebuilding our mental health system to serve our city's children, our neighbors with serious mental illness, and our loved ones facing addiction is not a problem that the city can solve alone. No amount of money can make up for the fact that insurance companies reimburse less for behavioral health care than for physical health care, draining billions of dollars from our mental health care system each year that could be plowed back into training into hiring more health workers, into creating more equitable access, improving quality, and supporting our community organizations. No amount of money can make up for lack of a workforce pipeline, which makes behavioral health careers less attractive, and that because of reimbursement constraints, drive behavioral health practitioners into the private sector, into private practice, away from serving the most vulnerable. To do what needs to be done, city, state, and federal government must work in lockstep to transform our mental health systems to expand our block grant funding for mental health and substance use disorder, and to ensure that we drive that grant funding into higher quality programming that delivers real results for people. To address mental health parity once and for all, especially for Medicaid. We must leverage opportunities like our pending Medicaid waiver here in New York State to drive dollars into social determinants of health, which are also the social determinants of mental health, like nutrition, housing, jobs, education, and transportation. We must study the effects of newly expanded tools such as telehealth and leverage what works. And we must be brave enough to end programs that simply aren't doing enough and to do so transparently and with a mind on our responsibilities to serve all New Yorkers and to deliver real results. 
The conditions are ripe for exactly this kind of structural change. Our partnership with Governor Hochul and our team at the state is as strong as it's ever been. And I'm grateful to Commissioner Ann Sullivan and her leadership and collaboration and to Commissioner Mary Bassett for her partnership, support and mentorship. We're already seeing the fruits of our growing collaboration in our city and for our mental health response. And for the first time in over 45 years, a sitting president is prioritizing mental health. And a number of promising pieces of federal bipartisan legislation have the potential to make significant change that will hopefully impact our city's mental health. And of course, as ever, we're grateful to Mayor Adams and to the entire administration for recognizing that healing and recovery and resilience after COVID-19 cannot be achieved without confronting our mental health crisis and that we have a once in a generation chance to do that and to get it right. Finally, a huge shout out to my team at the health department. All right, let's just give them a round of applause, please. Honestly, they're amazing. Their dedication inspires me daily and gives me the confidence to stand before you today and put a new stake in the ground on mental health. While we continue to fight COVID-19 and monkeypox and Legionella and a host of other challenges that many of you don't even hear about because we're on it, um, we're ready to center mental health in our public health agenda in our city. We're excited to work with all of you to build a level of social connection and community that will turn this mental health crisis into a public health revolution. Thank you so much.